to the Goleta Valley Chamber of Commerce's annual legislative summit. I'm Kristen Miller, President and CEO of the Chamber, and I'd like to welcome you, our members, our guests, elected officials, and our distinguished panel for being here today. Let's give them a warm welcome. Each year, the Chamber works hard to bring business and government together on issues that matter. We are grateful to have such a passionate community, businesses who engage in public policy matters, and elected officials who are truly accessible and engaged with us. But once a year, we get to have a group of our region's leaders together at one time and in one place. And today is that day. We thank you again for being here. I'd also like to thank the many sponsors who make today's event possible and the Chamber's work all year long on government affairs. Our presenting sponsors today are Bacar Resort and Spa and Marburg Industries. Let's thank them. Our supporting sponsors make this event and many others possible. They include Venico, Clear Commercial Vision Systems, Cabrillo Business Park, Citrix Online, Santa Barbara Airport, Santa Barbara Association of Realtors, the Kubion Family, and Community West Bank. Thank you to those sponsors. Sometimes I make them stand up. I didn't do that today. But I see you out there. Our very special event sponsors are ATK Space Systems, the Bank of Santa Barbara, Binet Barber Archibald Spray, Brownstein Hyatt Barber Shrek, Cox, Heritage Oaks Bank, Hollister Village, Latitude 34 Technologies. And I have more, but let's clap for them. Marmalade Cafe, Courtyard Marriott Santa Barbara Galita, Newshawk, ParentClick.com, Spherion, The Toads Group, TV Santa Barbara, University of California Santa Barbara, Union Bank, and Wilson Printing. Thank you. Quite an impressive list. I would also like to give a special thank you to Firestone Walker Brewing Company and Jay Bartman Photography. That's a little hint for the reception. Here, some photos. We're grateful that the entire city council uh, who is here in attendance today, in addition to our mayor, who will be introduced in a moment, we have Mayor Pro Tem Paula Perotti, Council Member Roger Aceves, Council Member Jim Farr, Council Member Tony Vallejo, Valerie Kushnaw. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our Chamber of Commerce Chairman of the Board, Mr. Don Donaldson. Thank you. Greetings and welcome all from the Goleta Valley Chamber of Commerce. We're very excited to be holding our fourth annual Legislative Summit. This is the only event on the South Coast that brings the business community together with our regionally elected officials. Uh, one of the Chamber's primary mission statements is to become involved as advocates and to represent businesses, and that's why we're helping with the aid of our panel today to put on this event. Um, thank you so much for all of the uh, panelists for for being with us. We know we have a lot of very busy schedules and uh, we're able to put it together with your help. So we very, very much appreciate that. Uh, we are actually have two panelists that we have not had before uh, related to, uh, well, you could say the drought and water. And, and I would just like to mention the Greater Water District in the city of Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. We'll get more formal introductions coming. But uh, with that being a topic of this year, that's very, very important. We thought it was, uh, it was good to have our uh, voice representatives here to talk about that, that and, uh, and other things. Now, we're going to be talking about at least five things today, perhaps more if we have time. So the drought, we're going to be talking about the minimum wage and its adjustments. We're going to be talking about one of our favorite issues, uh, Lolita Beach Park and uh, Will it still be there? Measure M and infrastructure spending, and also local and state uh, economic development. 
I would uh, like also to just take a, a, a moment of silence here. We have a, a special day. This is 9-11. And uh, I don't know, every time I think about it, uh, I have those visions in my head of what I was watching on the television, like I'm, I'm sure uh, uh, all of you do. So uh, I think uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, simply uh, remember that moment in time as uh, Americans and in honor of all those uh, that did perish by just taking a few seconds of silence. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to introduce to you today our moderator, Keith Woods. If you've been here before, you have seen Mr. Woods in action, always a delight and uh, entertaining at the same time. So we're hoping to get lots of information to you in a way that actually will keep you awake today. Uh, so he is, uh, serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the North Coast Builders Exchange, an 1800 member construction industry association. And he's also the former president and CEO of the Santa Rosa Chamber of Commerce for, uh, for 13 years. He's also a nice guy, and something you may not know about him, that I, I understand virtually no one knows about him, in the 60s, and you wouldn't tell me what year, but in the 1960s, he was on a uh, little league team that won the world championship. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> So without further ado, I would like to present Mr. Keith Woods. Thank you, Don. Uh, everybody's thinking, you played baseball with that body? Uh, yes, it was different back then. It's good to see all of you again. This is my third time at uh, one of the great chamber events I see around the country, your legislative summit. And uh, like last year, this is very special and meaningful to me because it's so rare that I get asked back anywhere <laughs> that this is an unbelievable treat of, for me. I'm, uh, I'm from Santa Rosa, California. Anybody been up to Sonoma County lately? If you haven't, uh, things are great up there. I bring you greetings. Uh, I, it's uh, always a thrill to get down to the Goleta Valley area, Santa Barbara. I just love it down here. And not a bad little place you've got here in Bacara. Uh, I'm a big fan of Golita and uh, the region, and uh, I'll continue sucking up to you uh, if I need to, but uh, we're so proud up in Sonoma. I think I mentioned our official theme up there is uh, Santa Rosa, the Golita of Northern California. Uh, that is the kind of uh, pride we have in uh, you and your city. Um, yeah, thank you, Don, for the nice introduction. I'm uh, always going to any chamber event I can. I'm just a chamber brat. And I love what Chambers of Commerce do. It's my entire career. I got out of uh, journalism school on a Friday many moons ago and started to work in the Chamber of Commerce industry profession. I served up in San Francisco, down in San Antonio, Texas, and then finally in Santa Rosa. I'm a Fresno State boy in journalism school. Oh, UCSB uh, begged me, pleaded with me to uh, come to school here and uh, offered all sorts of money, but I said no. No, you can keep your beautiful weather and your beaches and your ocean. I don't want to miss that Fresno experience. And maybe my only chance to really get over there and sweat a lot. So I ended up there at Fresno State. Uh, this summit is actually not very common. That's why I'm so pleased with uh, Don, Kristen, all the board members and staff at the chamber. What you do here is very special. Uh, one, to be able to get uh, uh, the uh, gathering of eagles that's up here at the table. This doesn't happen in many places. I get around and do a lot of programs for chambers. Like a little Johnny Chamber seed, I roam the country uh, tossing out things I've learned about what chambers do well. And I've not seen my, many programs like this. It's remarkable. So you'd be congratulated. Well, what you, you cited the mission of the, the chamber, Don, is a, a few minutes ago. Uh, you know what this feels like as a European chamber? Uh, because over in Europe, when I travel there talking to some chamber groups, you know the mission statement for a lot of chambers in Europe is, quote, to explain business to government and explain government to business. 
because sometimes they don't speak the same language. And part of your summit here today, to me, is doing a, a little bit of, of both. So uh, good to see uh, all of you here and the five up here. Thank you um, uh, for being here. Let's get started. Uh, they, they gave me a set of questions, but you know what, uh, Assemblyman, it's good to see you. Uh, good to see you. Uh, uh, so their questions were too tough, so I I'm going to start with you for... Uh, I just, we're just going to have two questions today, and I'll give you the softball ones. Uh, uh, one, uh, I want to know what your plan is to defeat ISIS, uh, and two, how are, you, and how are you going to cure cancer? That's taking No? No. That's all right. We'll get on with the program. You're, you're off the hook. Um, I get to introduce them. I just have been referring to uh, somebody I met last year, enjoyed very much, Assemblyman Das Williams. He was elected in November of 2010, represents the 35th Assembly District, includes over half of the county of Santa Barbara and nearly a quarter of the county of Ventura. He previously served on the Santa Barbara City Council, a position he was elected to in 2003. I'd like a round of applause for <laughs> Assemblyman Williams. Uh, Supervisor Janet Wolf is next to him. She began her career in public office in 1993 when she was elected to the Golita School Board. And I can tell you, Supervisor, I admire anybody that serves on a school board. That is tough. She served three terms. She was elected to the Board of Supervisors in 2006, and she represents the second district, which is about half of Golita and uh, parts of Santa Barbara. Please welcome Supervisor Janet Wolf. The mayor of Golita, I'm pleased to uh, see us with us, Michael T. Bennett. He was elected to the council in 2006 and re-elected again in 2010. He was appointed mayor pro tem in December 2012, and he also served as mayor back in 2008. Please welcome Mayor Michael Bennett. Elaine Schneider, it's good to have you uh, here. It's uh, your good neighbor. Uh, Elaine Schneider was elected to Santa Barbara's mayor in 2009. Prior to this position, she served for six years as a member of the council and as a commissioner for the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara. Please help welcome Mayor Helene Schneider. <laughs> and finally, in addition this year, since water is uh, on everybody's mind, if not in your taps, uh, is Bill Rose in this area. He moved to Golita in 2003 and was elected to the Board of Directors of the Golita Water District in 2008. His current term expires in 2016. So, Rose, it's good to have you here, sir. <laughs> All right, there are only two rules uh, today for the panelists, and that is candor and a little bit of brevity, and we're going to move right through this on some really critical issues. The irony is this is like Groundhog Day for me. The issues down here are often the issues up in my area, so I'm greatly interested in the discussion that's about to take place. The first uh, is going to be water related. Water, water, almost everywhere. Let me tell you, uh, I'll make a statement, and then Mr. Rosen, I'm going to ask you to open, make some comments. Uh, uh, the, uh, the drought will soon have an effect on Goleta businesses as the Goleta Water District may decide to enact a moratorium, or the M word, as we call it in the building community up there, a moratorium on new water hookups. Policy means that new development, either business or residential, can't proceed at the normal market pace. Do you think this is the correct policy for drought management, or does it uh, reinforce the boom and bust cycle of, of building and business development that's so common in California? Uh, does the Goleta moratorium get lifted? What procedures will end the moratorium? Mr. Rosen. Well, on uh, Tuesday, the Goleta Water District Board adopted uh, its uh, declaration of water emergency and also uh, uh, adopted the appropriate regulations to carry that out. We also defined who's a customer, who's not a customer, which I'll get to in just a second. And we uh, had to adopt a uh, moratorium. That moratorium is a function of, of two uh, laws. One is uh, Section 350 of the Water Code, which gives us the authority to do that in an emergency. But we also have a very unique uh, local initiative that was adopted in 1991 uh, called the Safe Water Supplies Ordinance. And that provides that uh, we are prohibited from uh, issuing uh, uh, meters for new and additional water service if we are not receiving 100% of our consumer water, water uh, 
where that uh, if there's any rationing, and there are two other issues, one dealing with the right decision, a uh, decision affecting the basin, and an obligation that we have to supply water to the basin. On October 1, uh, by virtue of the Bureau of uh, Reclamation and also the members of the uh, COM, which is the Chuma Operation and Maintenance Board, they agreed to reduce the uh, supply of water from the Chuma by to 45% of their total allocation. So we will be in a position where the same uh, will be carried out in the uh, manner in which it was intended. It is an example of how the law works. Now, whether people agree with it or they don't agree with it, uh, it's a, a, a guideline for the board. Uh, it has mandatory provisions. It uh, assures that the uh, drought buffer is uh, uh, protected. And uh, we're, we're going to uh, uh, carry that uh, mandate out effective October 1st. Uh, that reference I made to who was a customer, uh, the safe ordinance prohibits, uh, or put it differently, requires us to serve our current customers. And we have uh, defined in our uh, appropriate resolution who our customers are, what their situation is, and it basically deals with uh, projects that have been approved and water service that has been paid for prior to October 1st. Those people will not be affected by the uh, moratorium. Mr. President, water's the, the, uh, the battleground around the state of California. Every community is going through this. Normally in communities, a moratorium is the last resort. Was this the last resort, or was it a first option it was taken? It's not a question of last resort. It's a question of what the circumstances were, the factual circumstances, that the safe water was deals with. It's not a question of whether we could or couldn't do it. Uh, we were probably open to litigation not to take the action we did. Uh, I agree with you that it uh, probably is a, a, a last resort in many cases. In this particular case, once the triggers were uh, uh, met, we had to take the action that we did. Thank you. Mayor uh, Schneider, um, uh, how's the city and district uh, that you're in? How, how are you dealing with it? Are you banning new development? Uh, we tried in the city. Um, we, city of Santa Barbara, I think, has a very different growth pattern than other parts of Valley, we uh, are in the middle of a stage two drought. We have our, we've been having regular updates about the drought update. We have a big meeting coming up, um, not next week, the following week on the 23rd regarding the status of our um, desal plant, which is basically mothball that was put together about 25 years ago. And we're getting the report about what it will take and how much it would cost to put that back online for emergency purposes. Uh, if, the, if the drought continues in the rate that it has been within uh, two years, that desal plant in, in its capacity as an emergency water supply would basically cover 40% of the city's water need. And that's in, in addition to the uh, residents uh, conserving 20%. So it's a significant issue. It's a $30 million plus price tag just to turn on the tap, um, plus a very expensive process to uh, convert seawater into potable water. So we're taking this very seriously, and um, big meetings coming up and decisions about how to move forward if we need to. Thorny issue, huh? It is a thorny yeah. issue. We're, 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 we're able, thankfully, to time it because the residents have been able to conserve what we've been asking for. Um, they conserve 25% less water, 25% uh, water in, in August than the year before. Mm -hmm. We don't have to make the decision to uh, enter into a contract <coughs> until next April. So we have this next rainy season to see whether or not that will be necessary. But in the meantime, we're getting all our permits and processes in order. So if we do need to, um, you know, start that contract, we'll be ready to do it. That's why you get the big bucks as mayor, you know. There you go. Yeah, we're <laughs> mayor Bennett, uh, can you speak to uh, whether the water district is working uh, with, with the city uh, in terms of economic development plans? Like, did they take a list of new developments that would have been approved and determine lost revenue? Are you working with them? Well, we clearly, our staff works on an ongoing basis with the, uh, with the water district personnel. Uh, the city doesn't have any control over water. That's done by the water district. And I'll just start off by saying that uh, I personally uh, strongly support the Safe Water Act. Uh, it was imposed because we'd had two previous severe droughts and uh, the best minds were put together to come up with how we could solve that uh, boom-bust 
from drought and have an adequate water supply to carry our folks through that when the next drought is going to hit. There's no question of that hit. The only question is, is when. So here we are. Uh, one of the things that wasn't spoken to, we have a managed aquifer. And uh, we should really praise the Galena Water District as being the poster child for managing an aquifer in the state of California. If they want to know how to do it, and they want to know how to do it effectively and efficiently, they should make contact with the Galena Water District and uh, understand how the people supported that here in Galena Valley. And I think it served us very well. And one of the biggest questions I get on a continuing basis is, how can the city continue to um, approve projects that are coming through our system? Well, we approve projects based on the fact that in order to go forward, the water district has to authorize the water meters, or they have to evaluate the entitlement that may be uh, with the land. And that's been ongoing, and that is the only amount of water that's going forward that's uh, being approved for projects at this point in time. And as was previously stated, come October 1st, there will be no meters uh, issued for any uh, project that hasn't already been signed off by the water district prior to that date. So uh, again, I can't impress enough. I think the uh, uh, economic development that we've been successful with in our community uh, has gone hand in hand with the uh, Galena Water District with the constraints that we're uh, confronting and that um, it's very appropriate given the impacts. We don't know what this next water season is going to provide uh, beginning October 1st. So I think it's extremely prudent that we take care of our existing community and provide the necessary water for health and safety. And the Galena Water District is going to easily be able to do that. Um, I don't want to take your fire bill, but I think that we can safely okay. say that we're in excess of uh, some 50,000 acre feet underground that uh, doesn't evaporate and uh, is there for our use. And we can uh, properly manage it as the water district is done. And it's going to serve us for many years into the future if we were to have a major drought that doesn't change this next year or in the next two years. The leader's still going to be in good shape. Yeah, but a lot of communities are, are trying to do a cost-benefit analysis of what would have happened with fees and taxes of developments that didn't get approved. Wouldn't that offset the cost of uh, pumping uh, groundwater if you've got ample groundwater? Well, the point is, is you don't want to overdraft the, the water base. And we've been there done that. And we've spent the money through the water district to inject water into the aquifer to fill it back up where the rest of the state continues to draw down the aquifers, pretty soon there's going to be a muddy hole and there's not going to be any water there. That's not very responsible. Well, I think we're being extremely responsible. There's a lot of water in the ground. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is getting it out of the ground. Okay. Uh, our wells are pumping 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And under the best of circumstances, 6,000 acre feet maybe. Uh, just to give people an idea of where the water building the water district is, our Kachuma allocation is about 9,300 acre feet. After October 1st for the year, we'll be at about 4,200 acre feet. Our allocations of state water is 4,500 acre feet. And for the next year, we're expecting about 380 acre feet. And uh, lastly, our groundwater supply, which we expect, which you know, normally we plan at about 2,350, we're looking at four or five thousand acre feet to increase it and then we have some carryover water from prior years. So we will be able to uh, make it through the next year. But this is a very, very difficult uh, uh, situation for all of the agencies. So, okay. Sure. And, uh, uh, and especially for us and uh, as much as we uh, have indicated we have a, a pretty broad portfolio board and not everybody has all of those elements. Uh, we are being stressed uh, in uh, the ability to provide water to our customers. Okay, the Mayor, Mr. Rose, are you saying pumping more groundwater is off the table? That's not it's an not, option? It's not a question of pumping. If you're pumping it 24-7, uh, you're yes. pumping as much as you can. There are a number of, uh, there are, I believe, three wells that are uh, being rehabilitated and will possibly be online. But there are, there's a physical limitation of getting water out of the ground. It's a very complex and it's a very expensive process to uh, deal with it, but there's, there is water in the ground for, for use and uh, we're going to use it. Supervisor Wolf, does the county have a policy on uh, directing or working with the water districts? What's going on from your perspective? Yes, well, first of all, I thank Mr. Woods, and I also, before I get started, I want to thank Billy the Chamber for hosting this. Uh, this is my third, third of uh, four years being here, so 
I, I really do appreciate um, what you put together. So as as far as the county goes, um, you know we're not a, we're, we are not a water purveyor, uh, but what we have done, um, we're in the eighth month of a very serious drought, um, an official drought uh, in the county, and what the board of supervisors did along with our CEO is we put together a task force that includes. Um, our emergency operations uh, manager, Brian Rockebrand, our Ag Commissioner, Kathy Fisher, our Fire Chief, Mike Dyer, uh, Tom Bayram, who is our Director of Public Works for um, all things water, our CEO, working with CCWA and COM. So this is a, a, a group of important stakeholders that are monitoring the situation. We also have a public relations firm um, that has been getting the message out to the public. Um, it's WaterWise, uh, Santa Barbara, many of you probably have seen that. So a lot of it is getting information, pulling that information together, getting the information out to the stakeholders um, as well as, as to the public. We just had um, on Tuesday a very interesting uh, discussion at the board about water issues as it relates to the Cuyama Valley. And I think um, Assemblymember uh, Williams will talk about some water-related bills that will, um, if signed by the governor, will impact uh, the county. I, um, I don't know how anybody governs the state of California, Mr. Assemblyman. Uh, we have the facto, I always like to cite uh, that you'll win money in a bar. This looks like a bar crowd to me, so I feel fairly safe. Uh, as we sit here in this beautiful facility, one out of every eight Americans is a Californian. I repeat, one out of every eight U.S. citizens is in our state and our 58 counties, counties, any problem here is magnified uh, beyond belief. The, uh, let's talk the November ballot issue, uh, uh, the, the whole state water bond. Uh, one, is it good for business uh, in a community? And two, what are the effects of the drought and what do you think will happen in November? Well, I think what you're seeing here is that a lot of local water agencies don't have great options about how to deal with the drought. Um, you could um, try to be conservative, as many of them are, to try to stretch supplies as long as you can. Um, and I would actually agree with that strategy, but they're not great options. The best options that we have do cost money. Um, the best options that we have, have would be to radically increase our supply of recycled water, for example. Um, we don't use our water twice here in Goleta. And not even Santa Barbara, where we do have a substantial recycled water system, do we use all, enough of our water twice? Uh, and I would remind you that um, if we either just refused as a society to water our lawns with anything else than recycled water, we'd actually in this area be pretty okay. Um, and, and so um, if that's a better solution, if things like that, um, or I would also advocate uh, cash for grass, and I don't mean marijuana, um, the, uh, uh, the program that uh, Helene and myself uh, started uh, before I left the council, um, uh, we, the city of Santa Barbara, they like to have boring names sometimes for things. It's the Smart Landscaping Rebate Program, um, but everywhere else in the country they call it Cash for Grass, which rebates 50% of the cost for improved irrigation systems and making landscaping more drought tolerant. My lawn is dead and removed, and I'm proud of it. And people, we need to get with it. Um, and some places, some people need that financial incentive. We should have that incentive everywhere in the South Coast. Um, but on the bond particularly, yes. the, the reason why I talked about the local perspective first is to understand why the bond is important. If there's better options than the ones that local officials have in front of them, how do you make that happen? Well, the way that we can make things happen at the state level is the money, is bond funds. And in this proposed bond would be uh, $725 million available in a one-for-one -one match for expanding or building new recycled water systems. And you got the water, you just don't have the money for the system. Um, and we want to do something about that. We, um, uh, another one of those problems that we're trying to solve is uh, having make make sure that the local agencies are reimbursed for the some of the costs of the Kachuma pump. Uh, right now, water levels are dropping in Lake Kachuma. Um, you need to be able to pump that water to be able to get the rest of it out. 
Um, and uh, we have assurances from state agencies on what I mean. We, um, Senator Jackson and myself, that uh, $2 million will be provided um, uh, for that purpose. And um, there's much more that we can do as a community. There's still tremendous potential in conservation. And I would just urge people to think about that um, there are many solutions for drought that are very quick to, um, uh, to be able to execute, uh, very in step with our values, and very cheap. Um, and those are the conservation options we still have at our disposal, uh, including cash for grass. Or the city has another program that I think is really good uh, now, which pays half the cost for uh, hooking up gray water systems. Um, and uh, that is something that can also help us stretch our supplies. In total, this bond um, will do a lot um, in storage for the whole state. The storage doesn't really help us that much, but there's so much in recycled water uh, and in conservation and in um, uh, groundwater replenishment uh, funds um, here in the bond that that's got a lot for us to even those agencies that aren't state water. It, it always seems the battle's over storage. Uh, I don't know whether it's the environmental community or who doesn't want more dams built, but it seems like uh, when we do get significant rain, we don't have adequate storage. Yeah, and we're never going to have adequate storage. Why not? Um, because uh, the hydrologic cycle is changing dramatically in this state. Oh, well, now you're using um, big words on me. Don't yeah, well, that. you know, I was a brand graduate, so I got to show you guys a little bit. Uh, the hydrologic cycle is, is, is changing dramatically in the state. We're seeing much less snowpack and much more rain. And the problem with that is rain's very hard to detain for storage. Uh, snow is a lot easier to detain for storage. And uh, we're just going to have to live with that. And the best way to live with that is groundwater basins. We have tons of things that are far more effective than dams all around the state in storing water. They're called aquifers. They're called grant the ground, and um, and they're cheap, and uh, we just need to have a better system of how to govern it, and that's another bipartisan solution that was achieved this year. Um, the most, the best was really bipartisan agreement on a state water bond. Um, uh, the second, which was a little bit less bipartisan, but we got done, um, was adequate planning uh, and an adequate system for groundwater management. We are the only. Western state, only Western state, that does not have uh, regulation on groundwater. So if you have a deeper well, if you've got a deeper straw, you get to take as much as you want. And if you don't have a well, or if you have a shorter straw, you're SOL. So that is not a very good system for moving forward into a drought, and we have attempted to address that with legislation. We bring back to that bond measure. Just uh, I'm going to go off script here. Mr. Rosen, do you support uh, the uh, ballot measure in November? The ballot measure, sure. And, and, and <clears throat> we appreciate the, the money that's coming to uh, assist the local uh, water uh, purveyors with respect to the uh, Katrina project. That's a $6 billion mm -hmm. uh, project to uh, water normally goes into the intake tunnels by gravity. And so the water levels drop so low that they have to pumps to get the water into the system. Thank you. And I want to make sure I've got it right for the record. Williams supports pot sales. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure. Hey, we don't, don't worry. In four years, that's going to be a pot sales. <laughs> you know? uh, we get to stay with you, Mr. Williams, and then uh, uh, move down the line. The subject is uh, minimum wage. Went up to $9 an hour on uh, July 1st. It goes up again January 1st of 2016. Anybody that's been paying attention knows uh, that will happen. Um, what data do each of you, as we go down the line, uh, what do you rely on to determine whether raising the minimum wage uh, is an economic uh, benefit, or does it have detrimental elements to it to business, particularly on the South Coast? And as we all know, in the service sector, where minimum wage is far more frequent than, uh, say, construction or uh, or uh, other areas. If I could ask you, uh, what do you believe the schedule is uh, coincide with the economic recovery? You're a supporter of this, and we'll start with you, Mr. Assemblyman, and work down the line. Well, I voted for it. I know it's not always easy to deal with, but let's just look at this historically. Uh, for most of this uh, century, since the 1930s, um, productivity 
and wages went up at a similar scale, almost a mirror like this, up in, in a, a period of unparalleled prosperity for this nation and for this state. In what years and what was your source? Started, started in the 1930s. Um, the combination was economic growth and uh, higher levels of unionization. So uh, productivity and wages for over 40 years uh, went up at exactly the same pace. Since the 1970s, when wages did not continue going up, productivity in America has continued to go up by the same percent. So workers are still producing more every year in this country, but they haven't gotten uh, any more of a share of it since the 1970s. In fact, they're getting far less of a share of it. Okay, now I'm not advocating for or against it, but I do have to ask you about uh, uh, the law of unintended consequences. Could, uh, and I know it's been discussed and debated, but does that factor into this for you at all? That maybe some absolutely. people gain and some lose their jobs? It doesn't seem right. It, it absolutely factors uh, in, um, and, and uh, you know, there are some mitigating circumstances that I support and would have liked to see in the bill. You know, I do uh, like the idea of a tip credit, for example. Yeah, talk uh, about uh, that moment. Well, a tip credit is the idea of uh, restaurant uh, restaurateurs being able to build, build in um, a certain amount of the wage through the, the tip. Is there momentum for that in right. Sacramento? No, not a whole lot. Um, uh, and though there are some folks who, who believe that that's a good idea, there are not many of the folks that were willing to vote for the bill. Um, and so, you know, if I had a bunch of uh, uh, Democrats that see it my way and Republicans that would vote for a minimum wage bill and also a tip credit, you might see it, but almost everyone is either for or against the minimum wage on a partisan basis in Sacramento. That's the way it seems to be. Supervisor Wolf, and then I'll go to the mayor, so uh, what's the effect of the increase in minimum wage on hospitality, restaurant industry? Do you have any concerns about it? Well, let me, let me just say this is um, something that will, will be coming. The, you know, there are a lot of municipalities, I'm sure you've been aware, uh, from San Francisco to Los Angeles, where they've taken it, uh, they want to, you know, move forward with their own initiatives um, to increase um, uh, entry-level wages. The county, um, to my knowledge, I don't believe that there's anyone on the Board of Supervisors who is taking the initiative to move any, anything like that forward. Um, I, as you were talking about this, I pulled out um, the financial report from um, our auditor, Bob Geis. Um, what he said, the a average annual wages in 2012 were $48,800. Is that per capita or per household? Average annual wages. All right. That would now, be per capita. Now, in a year later, they have increased by $20 to $48,820. So the average annual wage in Santa Barbara County has increased by $20 in a year. Now, of course, that's, you know, that's taking into account the entire county. If you, if you compare that to the um, median house, the cost of a home, it's $648,000. Mm -hmm. Again, looking at the entire county. So um, I think I think that, um, you know, we live in this very desperate uh, county in, in Santa Barbara. So I think to make a, uh, if we were to do something like that as a county, we would, it would, I'm sure, be incredibly difficult because I think the impact to business in the North County would, would vary to different to uh, impact to businesses in the South County. Thank you. So, uh, to both mayors, you're in a tourism area, and uh, there's great competition throughout California for the almighty tourism dollar. What's going to be the effect uh, on uh, the tourism industry in uh, Golita itself and in Santa Barbara? Well, personally, I'm in favor of the uh, proposed increase that's going to be coming forward to the state. It's been approved. Um, I, I really don't see the negative side that some speak to. Uh, it'll be interesting to see, since this will be a, uh, an increase that can be better analyzed probably today than ever before to see what kind of impacts it might ultimately have. But I think it's to the benefit of the employees and, and to business, to be quite frank. If they have more money, they're earning more money, they have more money to spend. And people that make lower wages practically spend 100%, if not 100% of their money all the time. So this certainly helps, in my mind, in, in the economy. 
And I think, you know, if you look at In-N-Out Burger, I don't know how many people are aware, but In-N-Out Burger, they pay their employees to start at about $10.50 mm -hmm. an hour. I find that pretty amazing when people are claiming that they can't begin to pay beyond the federal minimum wage because they can't make it. Uh, obviously, I think their business plans are something longer and uh, something has to change. But there's all kinds of other examples. And, and I really resent big corporations. We don't have one here in the South County. And that's Walmart, for example, who pays uh, way below the... And then pushes all the health care costs on And all the health care costs go to the taxpayer. Whereas you can look at Costco. Costco, once again, is managing to make a profit. Uh, they do very well. And they pay, again, uh, a considerable amount above the minimum wage. So I think there's many examples to show it's doable. It's a maybe a lot of hard work to accomplish the task, but I think ultimately it'll be positive to the economy. Okay, let me play devil's advocate for a moment, or just the devil, whichever one you prefer. <laughs> <enjoy. laughs> the devil, that's okay. But there's circular logic here to me, and uh, with the greatest respect to elected officials, sometimes all these decisions are made by people who have never signed the front of a paycheck rather than the back of a paycheck. And your, the circular logic to me here is, uh, yep, there'll be more money if you give that extra buck to somebody, but how, uh, how many does it take of those to offset people who very well may lose their job? And wouldn't that somewhat offset, let me finish for a moment, uh, uh, somewhat offset it, and, uh, and, and again, there are things that sound good but may not do good. Okay. And I have concerns about yeah, that. Yeah, let me, let me answer that. The, I mean, the, the person who is most famous for, for making the argument that the Mayor Polito just did is, is not exactly a flaming socialist, Henry T. Ford. You know, he basically said, if workers don't have enough of the piece of the pie, they won't have enough to buy the product. And that is a really, really Point. And when you analyze um, the increased purchasing powers of workers versus the number of people that get laid off because of a growth of a minimum wage, you have to look at, at both, plus and minus. One is a, a positive on the economy, the other one is a negative on, on mm -hmm. the economy. And the data that I've seen consistently is that the rhetoric of the left and the right are both partially true. There is substantial economic benefit to the increased wage, there's also some contraction in terms of number of people employed, and you do a, essentially a very complicated arithmetic project to see if it's a, a substantial gain. And in this sure. case, at low wage levels, it's a very substantial Yeah, I, I, I do think uh, in response, it, you need to go back to 100 years to find a, a support your argument. Of, uh, question some of this, but I, I think, uh, I think uh, there are a lot of people that make these decisions who have a completely unrealistic, not you, not none of you, all the others, um, have a completely unrealistic view of what the profit margin is in most businesses. And they figure, okay, we cite Costco and Walmart and say, there, well, no, there aren't a lot of Costco's and Walmarts. There are a lot of small businesses eking out a living, and this can do serious damage. So I'm concerned about the law of unintended consequence. Uh, Mayor Schneider, it's your turn. Well, I think you can't just take one issue in a vacuum. I think you have to look at the bigger picture of how a business runs. And I think one of the big differences with bigger corporations... Can you pull your microphone up just sure. a little bit? One of the bigger di differences with bigger corporations over the last couple of decades is the, the gap between the lowest paid and the highest paid. And so you could have a, a corporation that can show where their profit margin is, and they make decisions on how to, on how to spend, you know, how to save or, or reinvest those profits, or pay their workers and who, which workers they pay, how much. And I, and I think that that has grown dramat dramatically over the last couple of decades. I don't think we're there are other things that happen in a in, in the business world where it might be more efficient that have the same impacts you're talking about. The, the potential negative impacts of minimum wage, for example, automating certain things or using diff different technologies that uh, a person used to do. And um, we see that ne not necessarily as a bad thing, but as a way to be competitive. And so you have to be, you have to look at a full business in, in the full picture. I think the concern as a government official, when we're looking at these policies, as was alluded to earlier, is you don't want to set up a, a, a pay structure system where the employees are working Two, one or two full-time jobs and still not able to make their basic needs met, so then they have to go to taxpayer subsidies to get things like health and shelter and 
food and whatnot, and that costs all of us money in the long run. So the particular California minimum wage, you know, it, it levels the playing field for all of us on the South Coast, for sure. Um, our hospitality industry, our hotel tax is, is doing the best it's ever done in, its, in the history of our um, accounting for it, and not necessarily because of low vacancy rates, but also because the, the room rate has also gone up. And so that's just, you know, more revenue per, per room. So I, I think it's, it's too easy to say the minimum wage equals this without doing a full study of, of, the, of the full picture. The city of Santa Barbara um, about eight years ago now adopted a living wage for, uh, for companies that contract with the city. And we're currently, we just, the council just put funding in to do a study about what have been the impacts over the last eight years. And so, one, you know, it'll be interesting data to see, but that will be a real life example of what's happening with a policy yeah. we made in our own city. Uh, living wage ordinances are, uh, uh, they're being proposed all around the 58 counties and 500 cities and towns in California. I have personally mixed feelings. I sat down with a living wage ordinance advocate and I said, yeah, should uh, local cities and counties get into telling employers what to pay? What next? Uh, you set a maximum wage? And the guy said to me, I'm not so sure that isn't a good idea. Please tell me you're not looking at that. We're not looking at that, but I think our particular ordinance. Seriously, that's what he said to me, and it yeah. was troublesome. Our particular ordinance, though, and I think this is another bigger picture, is the cost of health care. And uh, the particular ordinance in the city of Santa Barbara have different tiers depending if the employee has health insurance or not. Uh, meaning if the employee doesn't have health insurance, their wage is actually a little higher than those that do to actually incentivize the employer for providing health care to the employees. Um, there's an initiative on the November ballot that would actually give our insurance commissioner the same authority that many commissioners throughout, I think, 30 plus other states have in dealing with insurance companies who uh, for the insurance commissioner to basically have veto power over some uh, health insurance rates. Uh, the insurance commissioner can do that with our insurance and others, but not health care. And when we're seeing 14, 15% increases in, in health care costs, I think that's another big component. And we need to figure out how can we provide basic needs, especially to people who don't earn a lot of money over the course of a year, uh, without going necessarily into government subsidy programs. Mr. Rosen, you want to weigh on this? So are you okay? <laughs> My job is water, but uh, I, I've, I've, I've had experience negotiating labor contracts and uh, when I was in New York, we found that a number of our public employees were earning less than the minimum wage and we spent the money and we uh, made the commitment to bring them all up to the minimum wage. I don't believe that's the case anymore, but continue. That's not the case anymore, I understand that. Okay. And, uh, but, you know, all of our employees, as most government employees, they get an annual Salary. Uh, the minimum wage has been stagnated for many years and it has not moved with uh, both the cost of living and other uh, factors. And I don't find any significant uh, problem with the. Uh, yeah, I try so hard not to be some right wing nut. I really am not. I, I've tried to be balanced for social issues and uh, I. I I believe in government sometimes. I think I'm not the only one in the room that worries about the intrusion of government, where government might do things to people rather than for them. And that's what I always kind of keep as my, my uh, gauge, if you will. I'm not implying any of you are doing that, but I, I get a visceral reaction against uh, seeing the broad outreach of government. There, that's my plug. Uh, can we go on to, uh, uh, let, let's go on to, oh, this has been here on the agenda every year for those who have had the guts to come, the guts to come back each year. We chased away at least a couple of people who refused to come back. Every year, we've asked the panel about what's it going to be, supervisors. You're, you're Nostradamus here. We've asked the panel about Goleta Beach and the chambers' desire to see an erosion management plan. This all sound familiar to you, supervisor? Yes, you One that keeps the rock uh, uh, revetment. Revetment? I have that right, don't I? Yes, you yeah. Do. Yeah, to keep it in place. This year, uh, good news. Uh, Chamber's happy to say that uh, their preferred plan was adopted by the county and has been sent to the Coastal Commission. Starting with you, Supervisor Wolf, what can each of you add to the story that would ensure that the plan for saving Goleta Beach moves forward and gets approved? The floor and the microphone is yours, Supervisor. Well, yes, I am very excited that um, our, our application has gone to the Coastal Commission. 
We have an amendment to that original plan that the Coastal Commission had requested. It should be back to the Coastal Commission in approximately a month, and it will be online once it's, um, once it's delivered to the Coastal Commission. And then the Coastal Commission will set the hearing um, to what I hope to approve our permit. And what I would say to the community is, you know, we, we have struggled with this, with this issue. And I really feel that we have come together. We have a united front in that we, we've now seen the science. The Board of Supervisors has unanimously approved this project to keep the rocks in place. Mm -hmm. and, and my hope is, is that the community continues to stay together, come to the Coastal Commission, write your letters, and, um, and advocate for what the county's plan is. Um, so that, that's, that's my desire. I also, you know, I, we have a meeting coming up on Tuesday, and I think I want to tell the audience that we've never given up on Lolita Beach, even though we, we had this very difficult and challenging period of time. On Tuesday, we have an opportunity to approve a new um, bridge that will go over Lolita Beach to replace the old one that is essentially, um, well, we've, we've, um, we've retrofitted it to, to the extent that it's still in place, but we needed a new bridge. And um, we're, going to, we're moving forward with that. So we're having new pedestrian walkways, new bike paths, an area now where, the, where MTD can stop and, and pick up passengers to and from the beach. So we're not, we, we, would, we would never give up on Valida Beach. So we're moving forward with that. Renee Ball, I want to acknowledge Renee Ball. She's the assistant CEO from the, from the county, if you can raise your hand. She's been uh, very actively involved in um, moving our application forward in Galita Beach. Also, um, this is going to come up later, I believe, having to do with maintenance. Um, we have allocated uh, funds for our parks um, and our buildings, but this last year um, I asked the board for $500,000 during budget hearings to be allocated specifically to parks. Well, we did allocate $200,000. It wasn't what I had asked for, but a portion of that is going to Galita Beach. So we can you know, start retrofitting <coughs> the bathrooms, uh, the, 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 the grass, um, the, the, the um, drinking fountains, all of those amenities that people count on. So we're working, we're working on this, we're moving forward, and again, just to conclude, I, I hope that the community comes together in a positive way to help us get this approved by the council. We, we, Sonoma County, we fight uh, all that sounds so familiar. We fight access battles to the beach, uh, by erosion issues. Um, and Mayor Bennett, do uh, you agree that sometimes the Coastal Commission is just an agency out of control? Would you agree with that? Uh, I wouldn't put those words in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> then let me put some in. Uh, uh, Very good. We're off to a good start. Will the city continue its support all the way up to and through the Coastal Commission? Well, I would like to say that I, I, we've created a, a tremendously collaborative process on Galita Beach with the county. Good. And we're working hand in hand. We're very excited where we find ourselves. And uh, we will certainly be there to support the county uh, before the uh, Coastal Commission. And uh, in this particular instance, yeah, I think the Coastal Commission has been a bit unreasonable given the historic circumstances of the rocks. I mean, we've got grandfathered rocks. We've got permitted rocks, we've got emergency permitted rocks, we've got rocks that were just apparently put there in the 50s and 60s that no one can find any information out. At the end of the day, interestingly, if you walk down there today, you'll see, uh, and I was just down there, there's sand. And the rocks, you know, have an impact with that sand. Contrary to some of the comments about scouring and all the bad things are going to happen, the, the little fluke storm we had in March, which uh, uh, blew out windows and dining establishment in the city, uh, damaged uh, our pier at, uh, at Galita Beach and destroyed half the pier at Gaviota. That all occurred within a matter of minutes of each other. And the interesting thing is it, it cut out about seven feet of sand at Galita Beach. I went down there immediately afterwards to take a look at it. But you know what? The rocks that were out in front of the, of the uh, green grass area, which everybody loves, there were no rocks exposed. There were no rocks involved. I mean, it could have, if it had continued longer, it certainly would have gotten to the point where it would have begun to expose rocks, but there was nothing that was scouring the sand other than nature does what it does, and that's scour sand, and away it goes. And today you go down there, and there's sand in front of the rocks. You can't see the rocks, except if you're on the east parking lot. That's where the strange rocks exist that have been there forever. And 
people have to walk over, and they managed to do that because the east side is, is well populated with people laying out the sand. So my point is, is that uh, I'm excited on two points. One, that the county and the city are working so closely together. We're, on, we're in an alignment. Uh, we believe in what the county is doing, and we're doing everything we can to support them in this, in this effort. And um, I think the, the Coastal Commission, hopefully, uh, have had their eyes you know, widened a bit. There's been some instances elsewhere in our local area, uh, in Malibu, for example, where people didn't ask for permission. They dumped a bunch of rocks opposite uh, Broad Beach. If anybody knows where that is, and a few special people like Spielberg, among others, lived there, and they didn't mm -hmm. seem to have a problem with piling massive rocks. Now they're, this was like three or four years ago, now they're in the process of securing permanent permits for those rocks. There's a city that's just uh, north of us in another county who is about to lose their sanitary um, function because it's in an area that is impacted by the sea and the bluffs. Uh, they worked for years and years and years, couldn't get cooperation, they went ahead and secured the bluffs. Okay. So it's just an issue that I think that over time, the commission has to work with the local communities and understand what the nuances are. Port Mainini uh, had a road that was recently threatened. Rocks were put in place to protect that, uh, that crew there. And so these, I think, I think the commission is Good. is changing. Okay, my notes will reflect Bennett hates coastal commission. Okay. Yes. I, I just want to get this right. I mean, uh, Mayor could ask for a couple comments from you, and then any comment? Toledo Beach is really nice, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a great happy hour right at the end. Okay, <laughs> Schneider sucks up to Colita. <laughs> Uh, Assemblyman, could I, uh, uh, well, now that there's this local consensus. Yeah, I'm not going to interrupt this love, <laughs> love fest here. Uh, only to say that, I'm, you know, I'm not completely uh, convinced that everything will work out in a happy ending uh, with the Coastal Commission. Uh, uh, I do think that we have to think about that some of the rocks might be uh, permitted and some might not. Um, and that even if we got the best case scenario, we should be thinking about what other things we can do to protect Goliath Beach for the long haul. Um, the, I'll give you a for example. Um, those of you uh, that are old enough or are nerdy enough about, about the ocean know that back when Goliath's um, uh, beach's uh, sand uh, budget, is what you call it, um, was more stable, um, there was a large kelp forest in front of Goliath Beach. Uh, it stretched all the way from Campus Point out almost to uh, the same, um, uh, out as far as where the pier is. Mm -hmm. And uh, such a kelp forest would help protect us from wave action into the future. Um, their uh, Beacon, which is a joint powers agency, has a project um, that would um, uh, sink uh, uh, kelp anchors uh, and build a kelp forest. Well, the only thing that they're lacking is about 15 grand to get it done. And so there's other things that we should be doing to uh, protect the well, Okay, the but it's so hard to get cities and a county together whenever they well, do. No, this is, on this is like a We should be all, all jumping up and uh, down and enjoy that everybody's... No, these are your constituents, yeah. and if you get cities and county to agree, wouldn't that sort of be, if not marching orders, at least some guidance for you? Uh, it's absolutely guidance for me. I'm just saying that we need to be thinking about what more we can okay, do. And, and, and Janet's a member of Beacon. I was just going to say. And, I mean, has been on board with this project. Okay. I'm not criticizing. I'm okay. saying this is great no, okay. to have this love fest, but let's keep on going and think about what other work we need to be doing. Thank so I am, I am a member of Beacon, and since DOS was on a few years ago, this project um, got started, and it's, it is moving through the process, but that... But that doesn't that did not take away the responsibility for the county uh, to to make a decision and to seek permits. And our decision was to seek permits to keep the rocks in place. And I think it's just really important as we talk about minimum wage. And I, I gave you the example of what the average wage is in the county of Santa Barbara. And we all have all heard this number of 1.5 million people use um, Goleta Beach. You know, we can we can throw these numbers out, but I I think this is so important to the fact of what we have to do with the Coastal Commission, and that is to ensure that they understand that this is a place for people to come who may not have, um, who may not have the money to have a, a, a pool or um, a country club 
membership. This is and and for those of us, um, we we love Goleta Beach. It's our place where we go for retirement parties, birthday parties. It's it's our home, for sure. and that is what that is what the Coastal Commission needs to hear, and that's why it's so important to have the City of Goleta with us. On Great, this. Mr. Rosen, real quick uh, question: Does the current uh, rock revetment project uh, protect water lines that run along the coast? Are you satisfied with the plan that was approved? If not, uh, what do you recommend? Topic. Thank you all for your candor and, um, and your input. Topic number four, uh, um, the, the countywide initiative that would have forced the county to increase spending on infrastructure. Measure M, correct? Um, some believe that the failure to keep up with infrastructure spending on preventative maintenance uh, leads to bond measures that place more tax burden on voters. For the city, state, and water district reps, does this send a message to you of any kind in your jurisdictions as well? And to the supervisor, do you expect the county to respond in some meaningful way to the voters and their concerns? And we'll start down there. And that would be you, Mayor Schneider. Oh, that would be me. Okay. Well, I think one thing everyone agreed upon when Measure M was on the ballot is that there is a big issue, not only countywide, but in cities and nationwide, about it and that there is a need to make sure that your deferred maintenance doesn't get too deferred. Otherwise, that maintenance is going to turn into a rehab, which becomes more expensive. Um, the question is, how do you deal with it? And uh, actually, while all that was going on in the spring, the city of Santa Barbara, we created a subcommittee of myself and two council members, council member Rouse and um, White, who we've now just now put together a package of material we're right now going out to the community within Santa Barbara for about a 20 minute presentation to give an overview about what the city's issues are for infrastructure needs um, in our general fund in particular. The round number is about $350 million of projects we know we need that we don't know where the money funding is going to come from. So we are going out to the community and I think that the challenge is, is, is it's so complex the way the budget works. Uh, with no matter which government agency you're talking about, to try to figure out, well, how, how, how do you allocate money for one thing over another? What are the policies in place that you can have? And, and if you do need a new source of revenue, what's the best way for that to happen? So um, that conversation is currently just started. We just had our first uh, meeting yet last night with our board members and commissioners of our different boards and commissions. We're going out to uh, retirement community homes, to chambers, um, to whichever stakeholder group is interested, and hopefully getting a sense from the community where their priorities are, whether it be um, a police station for us that's more than 60 years old, that when it was first put together, there were 84 people in it, and now there are over 200, um, you know, and, and it's not seismically safe right now, to just basic street and road maintenance, to uh, other facilities. So um, this is important for us to figure out how do we prioritize and what are the potential options in terms of funding those things? Or do we just say certain things are just going to close for a long time? You know, on the city, county, state level, even feds, and in special district, deferred maintenance to me has always been the ultimate kicking the can down the road. Uh, like we can get by, let's just get through this year and then maybe it'll be somebody else's problem. That's got to stop. And I know the economy hasn't allowed that. But uh, it, it just it's bothersome to the average schmuck like me. Yeah, and I think I think a key piece, and I think the city of Santa Barbara anyway has been very innovative in trying to find different sources of money that um, we didn't think of before. And I'll give one example. Uh, we have we have a budget, a creeks committee, and this the voters put in that uh, hotel tax is twelve percent, but two of that twelve percent goes directly into our creeks uh, division that looks at. Uh, restoring creeks, but also dealing with uh, reef and ocean water quality issues. And we were able to look at uh, parking lots that are near creeks, so at Oak Park, at the Westside Community Center, um, some other places where we've repaved the parking lot now with permeable pavers. Mm -hmm. So the water then now goes into the water basin, the recharging water basin. Um, it cleans the water on the way through. It doesn't go through the storm drain and gets flushed out. And the source of funding we were able to use is not general fund money. Normally that type of project would have been 
fund it through general fund dollars. And because we had that dedicated source of funding, we were able to leverage state and federal funds for those projects. So it's going to take a little more creativity in figuring out how to uh, how to figure out how to pay for these things. Um, and I think as much as a city or county can be proactive in cobbling together its sources of funds and then go out for a grant, as opposed to the other way around, the more successful we will be. Thank you. Hey, Bill. Bill, can I call you Bill? Yeah. Hey, Bill, a, a kid up in the uh, in Santa Rosa area has just invented a fence that collects water when it rains to then water the garden. I thought but he's patenting it, he's doing pretty well with it. Got anything good like that? No, but uh, just to touch on uh, infrastructure, uh, three, yes. years, three years ago, uh, the Goleta Water District did uh, adopt an infrastructure improvement plan, which we identified and cataloged uh, each of the projects that we had and rated them, uh, whether they be thousands of valves that we have to do on them, or the pipes in the ground, or facilities, this is a Corona Del Mar water treatment plant, on, 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 on about these things. And each year at uh, budget time, uh, we're presented with a uh, list of projects that uh, they're going to undertake. For the How old are most of your water lines? How far back did they go? Oh, uh, the 50s, I think. Uh, probably uh, even further back than that in some cases. Uh, the pictures we have uh, around are all from uh, uh, 50s and 60s. There hasn't been any significant uh, uh, renewal of those pipes in, uh, in a long time. Uh, uh, Mayor Bennett, uh, the are the voters are going to accept more tax burdens, more bond measures, taking on more debt, and do they have to? Well, we don't have any debt. So uh, that's an easy answer for me. Uh, being a new city, we were, we, uh, the new cities get uh, state subventions that are greater than you will normally get. They run out after six mm -hmm. years for uh, roadway maintenance. They run out after seven years for other purposes. So we had quite an infusion of money from the state uh, for the first six years of the incorporation. And we utilized that money to replace our uh, buckled sidewalks and curbs and gutters and uh, road paving. And we brought our road paving index. The goal is always to be at 70, and uh, that's difficult to achieve. But we've managed to get very close. We're up into the, I believe we're up into the 50 uh, range at this point in time. We did get through some uh, stimulus money. <coughs> Receive that we did allocate once again to uh, roadway maintenance, and we were successful for once again continuing to improve our uh, roadway system. And we've been um, very conscious about throwing uh, general fund money into the into the bag as well for uh, maintaining that road maintenance. And I'm emphasizing road maintenance and curbs and gutters and sidewalks because the city of Galena does not own very many buildings. Uh, we own the library. <coughs> Uh, we have some uh, cultural structures uh, at Rancho La Terra that we own, and we have uh, uh, the community center that we own. But we're also blessed with some nonprofits that operate in those facilities, and they have their own responsibilities of maintaining the buildings. So our maintenance there is somewhat limited. So uh, again, our emphasis has been on uh, roadways, and uh, but we still don't have enough. I mean, it's never enough. As our public works director constantly emphasized, the day you pave the road, it's already beginning to deteriorate. So it, it, and this is what you're constantly up against, whether it be the weather or uh, construction projects that tear up the new road, and everybody knows yeah. about those. Uh, it, it, it's just a, an ongoing issue that you have to stay on top of. But I'm not here to tell you that we have enough money to maintain that. We just do not. And Mr. Assemblyman, uh, you could go back to 03 when you got elected to the council. and. Uh, I bet there were deferred maintenance issues then, and you've uh, certainly observed that at the state. We have an infrastructure in trouble across the state of California. We do, and uh, I'll just say that the big picture, we have to decide as a society, are we going to be a crumbling empire, or are we going to be on the rise? Um, and that takes investment. We cannot continue to skate off of the investments that um, our parents and grandparents made as a society. And you know what? They paid for them. And it will mean that we pay. If we want uh, infrastructure to work, if we want infrastructure to attract and retain economic activity, which is its basic function, um, we need to make the investments in that. Uh, 
Um, and sometimes, as in the Creeks Division, which was, you know, that, that, that's very popular now, but it was attacked at the time as the largest tax increase in Santa Barbara history. But everybody loves it now. Um, but it, it, it's, it's an investment, and we have been very reluctant to make an investment uh, in our infrastructure and in our future economic activity. And this isn't just important in streets and roads, and water systems, and, and, and sewer systems, which I think my record on the council has been very, very good for uh, increasing the uptick of infrastructure uh, maintenance. Um, but this is also about the infrastructure that is most important to the economy of the Goleta Valley and, and of all Santa Barbara County, and that is our higher educational infrastructure. Our, you know, the, the, the members of this chamber, half of them, are members that are here because they have access to skilled, educated, entry-level employees. It, it's no accident that the, there's a ring of these businesses around the UCSB. And we are skating off of the investments of the 1960s and 70s in our uh, higher education system. This year, this year is the first year in our history that we are educating less than what the education master plan called for. And if we're gonna have skilled, educated employees in the future that will help drive our economic activity, we need to enroll more students and uptake that infrastructure. And, and the, there are 120 members of the state legislature. 119 of them aren't here, so we're going to hold you accountable for all for my next question. The, the, it just seems like the public is viewed as a cash cow that can be milked for sales tax increases, bond measures. Uh, there's a, a whole, uh, there's a slew of people out there, Mr. Assemblyman, who I, I think feel that Sacramento and even local government ought to clean up their house in terms of uh, 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 reduction in expenses before looking for, for more money. CEQA uh, it is, uh, is now a weapon rather than a tool and needs reforming. The pension system has not been reformed to any great degree in the eyes of most people. Shouldn't the government try to tighten up before going back to the cow? I, I think you're on uh, the talking points of four years ago. You, you, you gotta get on the talking points of now. Last year, really? I told you that the legislature Two-thirds Democrats balanced a state budget that was $26 billion in deficit. You didn't believe me, but uh, hopefully it's come out in the press enough to know that is true. And we did that $26 billion deficit and fixed that only a small portion of that, or uh, less than a third, was through taxes. Mm -hmm. $7 billion was done through Proposition 30. The rest was done through cuts and economic activity. Most of that was cuts enormous amount of um, what some would consider uh, bloat, but some might consider uh, pretty important <coughs> services, had to be sacrificed so that the state budget and so that our economic prosperity could move forward. And I can tell you, one of those jobs that was eliminated, that was my mom, right? Uh, and so we made great sacrifices. Yes, I voted to cut the job of my mom, among other people, that um, because we needed to move forward as a state into better economic activity, and that required us balancing our budget and paying off our debt. And the state is doing that, and it's doing that with uh, a real small modicum of uh, okay. taxes through Prop 30, and doing it mostly through better policy, better leadership, um, and uh, you know the pension system was one of the other things we had to change in order for that right. cash to work out. Yeah. Um, and the changes might seem small to you, but they're very big to the people right. who yeah. were getting those benefits. And let me make very clear, they're my beliefs, not talking points. So I sure. resent that uh, you I'm described in that I'm way. I'm just saying, Supervisor you, it's, it's almost as if you didn't listen or fact check from the things we told you last year. These changes have been made. Pension, pensions have been reformed. Bal budgets have been balanced. We're giving back $10 million this year to K-12 schools. We, we passed a, spit, a, a rainy day fund so that we are packing away money for the next time we have an economic. Thank you. We'll make a
note Williams is getting sick of wood. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Wolf, did you get a chance to weigh in on uh, this? Well, because Measure M was a county initiative. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, one of our supervisors really led the charge on that. And it went to the voters, and, and it failed. Um, the other four supervisors did not support the initiative. And I'll, I'll just speak for myself. Having, as you mentioned at the beginning, having served on the school board for 12 years, and um, now on the board of supervisors for eight years, um, it's really important for me that the that the board that was that is elected by the people have the discretion in the budget making process. And uh, Measure M would have taken a big portion of that away uh, from our discretion, but. We understood that of the importance, and I think everyone here understands the importance of, of maintenance of our infrastructure and, and, and keeping things up to date so that we don't keep kicking the can down the road. Mm -hmm. So I just want to talk a little bit about what the county did because you were asking about that. We did not raise, we didn't raise taxes. Um, we, made, we made some cuts. Obviously the economy uh, was improving. And we knew that we needed to um, take a strong stand in allocation of funds for deferred maintenance. Now, in the past, we had set aside money. But what we, what we didn't know, is we, as Mayor Schneider had talked about, um, a study. We, we did complete a study in the county. And um, we found that our deferred maintenance backlog was $114 million. And that was for our roads and $83 million for buildings and parks. So what we did during our last budget hearing is we made a policy statement that for any new revenue that comes into the county, 18% of that revenue is going into the maintenance um, of our infrastructure for parks, roads, and buildings. Okay. So we took a step in doing that. We expect that within the next uh, 10 years, we will have accumulated $100 million by doing that. Um, aside from that, we also allocated $1.5 million that was going to take care of the smaller issues that were in that report. You know, when you look at a, a report that talks about $83 million in repairs, it's sometimes, um, you almost don't know where to start. Well, what our staff did is they looked at that report and they picked up the items that, you know, sometimes we could do in our house. You, you, you don't want to, you, you could fix a faucet even though you know you're, um, you need to fix the roof. So, what we're doing in the county is we have allocated that $1.5 million to our general services department to get out there and do the small fixes in our county buildings, in our parks that we need to get done, while not forgetting that we have the bigger projects. So we've got a plan. Um, I, I, I think Measure M was uh, perhaps, you know, it, it brought it to light, but I don't think it was the right, um, the right way to move. Um, we're going to, uh, uh, since we got started a little bit late, we're going to run just a little bit over. I know that we're all that's separating you from food and drink, so we don't want to be in that position. But we have one more important topic, and then I'm going to ask for a closing comment. So uh, you can uh, be somewhat brief in these. It's a, a important topic, and that's economic development in the cities, county, and the state. Uh, the economy uh, improves. Well, what's ahead? And Mayor Bennett, I'd like to start with you. Uh, very visible economic development right now with construction happening, but what's next? Uh, it's a long planning process. What, what is the economy going to look like in years ahead, and what's the city's role? Well, I think that um, where we're headed at this point in time, and, and we're uh, going forward with what our general plan calls for, and, um, and very soon, which was predicted by a former uh, planning director, is the city is going to be built out. The area that can be built upon will, in fact, that, that will have occurred, um, irrespective of, of the water moratorium. But going on further, we've uh, instituted in cooperation with the university and with the Chamber of Commerce a program called GEM, which is the Lead Entrepreneurial Magnet, which I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with. And I think this is just a great opportunity where business and government can get together and really. Um, and it's not pioneering the concept. The concept's been around a long time uh, to move forward in this collaborative fashion uh, and to bring young folks in or old folks in or whoever who has an idea and offer them an opportunity through some space and some support and through mentoring on how they might establish a business or improve a business. Uh, we know they don't all, uh, are not all so successful uh, over the course of a year, but we think this will give them a real boost uh, currently, I believe we have six candidates uh, 
uh, that are moving forward with their uh, product line and their ideas for uh, future business. And uh, that's being supported uh, through some uh, angels that have donated, but the city of Toledo donated, as did the university, to get this thing up off the ground and provide the necessary space for these people to go forward. So I'm extremely excited about that. I, there's, there's, there's not many communities that have taken economic development to that level or to that degree to push forward these incubator concepts. But uh, we're in the midst of it, and I, I'm very optimistic that we're going to be extremely successful. Good. If you uh, get any anonymous contributions, the effort that was from me. Yeah. That's <laughs> right. Mayor Schneider, uh, uh, the, the GEM program, they seem to be staking out their plan. For what Are you uh, targeting any sector for economic development in Santa Barbara? So there, one particular project I want to mention, because it also really pertains to this area in the Goleta Valley, and then more of a an issue or a, um, a way a city should and can work with small businesses. Um, the project, and you may have seen this in the news recently, is uh, allowing, we made the, a big decision to allow direct relief to actually purchase proper, city-owned property um, by the airport for their for a new facility that they're going to build and for their, for their warehouse needs and keeping them here on the south coast, which for emergency preparedness reasons uh, is fantastic and I think having direct relief in our own neck of the woods and their global impact is, is fantastic as well. Um, the money that we're, the city is going to receive for this project is going to then fund what we've been trying to do for 20 plus years on that site, which is just um, north of Hollister from where the E-Bar used to be, uh, where the target was supposed to go once upon a time, which we said no to. Um, you have that as another issue. But this project here is supposed to be entrepreneurial type of tech startup place and having the city actually finance the structure of it and then work with the private community on, on who wants to lead it. So um, it's been the very nascent stages of design and planning and, and thought process it still obviously has to go through the entire permitting and planning process. Um, but we're very excited. It's been something that's been talked about there for uh, literally 20 years, way before I even I got on the council. There have been many uh, um, proposals that have come and gone, and we really think this is a good way to make that work. So that's exciting. The second thing I'll just mention is uh, a year ago, I conducted a number of breakfasts with local businesses, both startup in the tech world and also just small businesses in Santa Barbara, and saying, well, what's the role of the city in, in your life? And um, that was a heated breakfast. Uh, but uh, one of the things that came out of there was how can we work with small businesses who really don't know the permitting and planning process to help them, especially when they need tenant improvements or getting through just the design review process, what can we help them do ahead of time so that they don't fall in love with a place, for example, that they don't realize that's going to need a significant amount of time and money for infrastructure improvements and code requirements. So we're putting together a series of how-to videos on our website. We're going to go out um, in it soon talking about what do I need to know before I purchase a property? What do I need to know about waste management and trash and recycling? What do I need to know about water conservation? What do I need to know about ADA um, and dealing with the city to hopefully have that stronger communication between local businesses in the city? Thank you. Supervisor Wolf, everywhere I go, uh, the successful communities are the ones where they think regionally in economic development and don't get provincial city by city. And uh, if I understand right, the county's funded uh, a collaboration of seven chambers to the tune of $150,000 to develop a regional economic strategy. Good for you and good for those chambers. Uh, what do you expect to come out of that and will you uh, follow and support what they come up with? Um, thank you for that. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful idea. It was brought to us um, by the chambers and it was $150,000 for seed money, for startup money. And, you know, sometimes, you know, when you talk about government getting involved with businesses, this is one of those instances where, um, we, you know, we had the discussion, we saw the plan, and um, the Board of Supervisors during our last budget hearing felt that it was, it was a plan that was going to, um, that was going to entice all businesses throughout the county and that it was a worthwhile investment. So that's what we did. And, you know, we just blessed the project. What, what do I expect out of it? Um, you know, we'll, we'll be meeting back with the chambers again, but I think we have, all of us collectively have enough confidence in our chambers that they're going to be doing something worthwhile. And I just want to comment on, on the GEM program because I did have an opportunity to go visit the site, and I think it's the most innovative and incredible program, and I, I 
salute the city of Goleta for working um, with UCSB and, and getting that project forward. The other thing that the county has done is we've also allocated funds um, to our to visit Santa Barbara our tourism um, industry and um, and and well at the, in the past we had allocated money specifically to the chambers but I want to make one other point. Lots of times businesses will get um, will have impacts such as the beach side did when we had that big storm and so government should be there to help and assist so it's not just always you know making things better but it's also realizing that when a government when there is a tragedy or there is a situation where government can help we should step in and try to do that so i know my office has worked with our ceo in helping um, the boathouse um, in a lot of improvements that they needed uh, to enhance their business from, from lights we're actually putting in a brand new restroom at the boathouse restaurant and when the beachside restaurant had the, the flooding there the county came in and worked with the owner to help him so that he could open in a few days. He was a, he's amazing, and I should also say the community came in and did a lot of work too. You hear a lot of talk about boots on the ground overseas. I've always considered the Chambers of Commerce are the boots on the ground for economic development and the people you ought to turn to most to do the job. And uh, <coughs> I think if you view them that way, you'll keep the collaboration. Mr. Assemblyman, uh, I understand I was told that uh, State Go Biz Director Kish Rajan was uh, in town recently to talk to the Workforce Investment Board Chamber, business leaders. Other than that, uh, there's often in communities a disconnect between state resources and local economic development. Uh, I'm sure you have a commitment to local job creation. What can you and your state government uh, do to help foster local jobs? Yeah, I, I've seen a disconnect uh, happen often, and not just uh, between the state and, and uh, local businesses. When I was on the city council, I went over and, and visited Deckers, because at the time, Deckers was a, a, a sub-leasee of city property right at the airport. And I went by and talked with their uh, CFO, and I was like, you know, so how's it, how's it going here being a tenant? He's like, he was shocked. Um, he had never talked ever to any city official about anything. And I was, I was, I was bored. I was like, wait a minute, this is a, a sub-leasee. They're not a direct tenant, but they are a sub-leasee of a direct tenant of the city. They're operating on city property, and they're our biggest uh, non-government employee employer. And you've never had a conversation with the, the city officials. So, I mean. But the caveat for everything I say today is we need to hear from you. And um, the thing that I have heard most about economic development and the needs of local businesses from local business owners, uh, particularly, this is particularly true, uh, higher wage uh, businesses, is that is two things that are really aren't that hard. You know, um, uh, well, they're hard to execute, but they're not hard to figure out what they need, which is, housing for their employees, and uh, skilled, educated, and entry-level employees. That's the same thing. It's been the same thing the entire time that I've worked uh, in government. And we don't need any more studies to necessarily figure out that that's what we need. That's what we need. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess it helps sometimes to organize um, uh, meetings to reiterate that. Uh, and I did that. Uh, I don't have fancy acronym, though I think GEM is an awesome program. Um, uh, uh, but it, it, it shouldn't be a mystery to any of us what our local businesses need most. Tax policy is important, regulation is important, but the big ones have for, been for us housing and, uh, and, and, and uh, how many skilled employees are we getting out of, out, of, out of higher ed. In addition, I would not I don't think you should short trip what we've been doing with GoBiz. This state, until last year, was the only state that taxed both the input and output of manufacturing. We no longer do that. That's a dumb idea. You know, if you're going to uh, uh, tax outputs, that's what normally things, but you know, we eliminated the tax for the purchase of manufacturing equipment because you don't want to disincentivize the purchase of manufacturing. Uh, we also extended that to research, equipment, um, hiring credits, the California Keep Competes Investment Incentive. Um, uh, these, are, these are big things for a state that's normally lampooned for only making things 
more difficult. Um, and, and we shouldn't stop there, um, but uh, we're making tremendous progress in terms of pragmatism and state government about Good. how to deal with it. Good. Uh, and closing comments, if you can, uh, uh, just for uh, a minute or less, give any final things, Mr. Rosen, words of wisdom, pieces of advice in 60 seconds. Save water. <laughs> okay. You're a hit with everyone. Mayor Schneider, again, thank you. Thank you for coming over. Well, I, actually, I do very much appreciate being invited uh, here in mean, the Goleta Chamber, but really in terms of economic development and business growth and, and connectivity, the South Coast is one region. And we each have our strengths and we have different, different um, philosophies, not just philosophies, but just sort of different aspects of what makes the South Coast fantastic. Uh, you know, the cultural arts community is big in the city of Santa Barbara. Um, we wouldn't have a uh, thing that we, Mayor Bennett and I were just saying they couldn't have Decker stayed on the South Coast and they got a facility that worked for them, that worked for Goleta, that Santa Barbara just didn't have that kind of space. So figuring out all the different pieces I think makes a big, uh, helps quite a bit and looking regionally is a big piece and I'd love, as always, to hear from you on your ideas. So I appreciate your time. And, and um, Mr. Rosen, I've changed from uh, bourbon and water to bourbon and coke, so I want you to know I'm doing my best to contribute. <laughs> Mayor Bennett, good of you to take your time to be here. Final parting words of wisdom. Yes, I first would like to thank the Chamber for the opportunity to once again uh, address the community in, in this particular environment. I think it's real healthy and I'm happy to see that it's continued for as long as I ask. And I'm optimistic and hopeful it will continue on into the future. So this is a real, really great opportunity. And I'd just like to you know, throw out a, a kudo, because uh, sometimes government gets shots taken at them by the development community, and some rightfully so. In the case of Deckers, they had a timeline that um, was interesting, I can say. And they were looking at Texas, they were looking at Ventura, they were looking elsewhere to go. And, um, but they needed a commitment out of the city of Goleta to process in uh, X number of, of uh, weeks. And I have to say that our council, uh, it was a, a bit of a challenge, a little difficult, had special meetings, but we did it. And we got them. And then they had some bumps in the road, and they didn't need it quite as quick as they needed it because they had some other things to take care of. But that's okay. I understand. That happens to business sometimes, just like it does in government sometimes. It takes a little longer. But in this case, we were able to produce what they needed in a speedy fashion, and they were excited. And, okay. 80% of their employees live locally, which is huge for any business. Yeah, that's great. Supervisor Wolf, it's good to see you again. I hope you enjoy the dialogue and I the did. chance to talk with people. Yes, I, I did enjoy it. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Uh, before I close, I just wanted to introduce um, Aaron Weber is here from Supervisor Farr's office. Aaron, there's Aaron. And also Hillary Campbell is here from my office. So thank you both for being here. One minute of fighting, final comments. <laughs> That was good, that didn't count. <laughs> uh, again, I just want to thank you all for being here. The county um, is seeing some very moderate and sustained growth uh, financially. We're, we're definitely on an upswing. But I think all of us are taking this, um, we're, we're being very cautiously optimistic because while we're seeing some improvements, we have a lot of obligations in the county. Uh, many of you know we have the, the North County Jail that is a huge, um, huge obligation, obligation for the county. Uh, we do have the capital expenses that I mentioned before, but we also have our human infrastructure that the county is responsible for, not just our employees, but the, but the people who live in this county, who live and work here. So we have that responsibility. We are an arm of the state government to make sure that we provide the medical services, social services, and welfare uh, to all the citizens of Santa Barbara County. Our Board of Supervisors uh, works very well together. Um, we have oftentimes some diff differing opinions, but we continue to be extremely respectful of each other. And I'm also very proud to, to say that our new CEO, Mono Miyasato, who started in December, um, has been a tremendous uh, positive impact on our county. We're very excited to have her. And she came from, um, what's the Mendocino? I don't know if you're in Marin County, so you're, you're but anyway, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Sutherland, you have a busy schedule and thank you. this budget to come back yes, uh, again this year. So thank you. Final words of wisdom, sir? Sure. Uh, I just want to tell you that the two, I think,
most important legislation that we got done this year um, uh, that I offered personally. One is um, a economic development bill um, uh, that eliminates a, a loophole in recycling law uh, that um, composting industry and associations like the one that uh, Marburg belongs to believes uh, could help create 14,000 uh, new jobs, uh, admittedly that's statewide. Uh, but that's a significant economic development bill. Um, and secondly, uh, a bill uh, to deal with uh, essentially um, uh, the tragedy in Isla Vista. Um, uh, and uh, I think that's important too, is AB 1014. It, it um, establishes a reasonable a legal right um, for uh, parents, love, uh, spouses, and uh, law enforcement um, to uh, intervene somebody is a danger to themselves or others uh, and possesses a firearm. Um, but I, I want to use that to tee off a plea that we have a real, um, it's really important for this community to gather together to um, solve some of the demographic and economic issues that um, uh, creates um, problems and uh, human pain uh, out in our own community in Isla Vista. Uh, it's something that if we um, were more economic investment, if there were more demographic diversity, um, are issues eminently solvable. Um, and I say this as someone who grew up there, and so I'm very aware of the challenges of that densely populated small area. Um, but uh, this is the things that are have happened that are highlights in the last two years have only happened we kind of, kind of sometimes as a community throw up our hands and say, oh, that's out of this. It's not solvable. Uh, well, a lot of those issues are solvable, and I hope that we can work together as a community to address them. Excellent. Uh, I, I would like not a half-hearted round of applause, but a very hearty round of applause for these five. <laughs> See this many other places. Speaking of the chamber, for them to be creative enough and spend the time and energy, I'd like for the chamber itself, the board, and its staff to get a round of applause as well. Thank you. Thank you. Sponsors, who you couldn't do this without the sponsors. You have a great community. I, I enjoy it every time I'm down here. Just seems to get better and better. So don't screw it up, please. Uh, I really enjoy this place so much. With that, uh, there is a reception going on outside. Those of you at the uh, table here who can join uh, the, uh, uh, the, the little event, I'm sure people appreciate it. If you need to run, we understand that as well. Um, thank you for letting me come down and do this, and we are adjourned.